antisocial. Why the narcissist stops you socializing. This video analyzes the thoughts and motivations adopted by the narcissist with regard to your going out socially. What I'm about to explain is mainly applicable to lesser and mid-range narcissists. I'm also going to provide you with a conversational example which is applicable to mid-range narcissists, most likely middle mid-range and upper mid-range. We do not like you to socialize without us. Why would you want to be anywhere else other than by our side, marveling at how brilliant we are? Why on earth would you want to spend time with someone who's clearly inferior to us? What are you going to be doing by going out with somebody else? What are you up to? Are you straining against the leash that has been placed upon you? You're clearly being disloyal, threatening our control, and that does not please us. Moreover, if you're elsewhere, what are you not providing us with? Fuel. And therefore, the assertion of some form of independence by you, by going off and doing your own things and socialising without us, is a terrible and selfish thing for you to do from the narcissistic perspective. If you are going out with others, this will cause wounding to us. In general terms, and especially with regard to lesser and mid-range narcissists, they don't like you to spend time with other people because of the unconscious fear that those individuals will somehow assert some influence over you and pull you away from our control. If you are away from us, you are being subjected to other influences. And this isn't because the narcissist recognises that he's not treating you well, and therefore your friends might point this out to you. Not at all. But rather, it is driven by the fact that those people are seen through the narcissistic perspective, through the administration of the narcissist paranoia, as potentially problematic because, of course, if they have caused you to go and spend time with them, you are threatening, that threatens our control. And therefore, not only are you painted black, but they're painted black. And since they're painted black, the narcissist views their motivations as ones driven by treachery, nastiness towards the narcissist. It's nothing to do with thinking that they are good people. And, of course, those individuals will have asked you out for their own motivations, which are nothing to do with trying to pull you away from the narcissist, but that's not how the narcissist perceives it. You, unless the narcissist wants you to be elsewhere, in which case you'll receive the narcissist's blessing and you're still painted white, but more usually, if you're asserting some degree of independence, and especially with lesser and mid-range narcissists, that threatens those narcissists' sense of control. And anybody who is viewed as complicit in causing you to go elsewhere is similarly problematic. And even though they may do it for the most fair and honest of reasons, the narcissist will not see it that way. The paranoia of the narcissist suggests that they are somehow trying to undermine the narcissist in your eyes and turn you against the narcissist. The narcissist recognises this, this because they are jealous of what you and the narcissist have together. And rather than be pleased for you, they are smearing the good name of the narcissist. The narcissist forms this view as well. You want to listen to them. Otherwise, why would you be going you are just as bad as them. This witch's coven that's plotting and planning against us, you want to go and embrace them. That must mean you agree with them. Our careful and structured control of you, our isolation of you, all stands to be damaged by your socialising with those who we have not got control over. The less from mid-range narcissists will have tried, but for some reason hasn't been able to assert direct control and therefore has done so by ignoring those friends. However, they haven't gone away. And therefore, although the narcissist may form the view of 
possibly thinking he should feel sorry for them because he sees them as selfish, bitter and twisted, but he won't because he won't feel sorry for them or you, but only for himself. That lesser or mid-range narcissist wants you with the narcissist where he can keep an eye on you and thus control you. The narcissist wants you with us to supply us with fuel. That is your rightful place. That is why you are the intimate partner primary source or the intimate partner secondary source. That is the role that you have been given and you ought to fulfill it. And therefore, by organizing to go out for a meal with these friends, you are in effect telling the narcissist that he or she is not good enough to spend time with. Remember, that is how it is viewed through the narcissistic perspective. You are, in effect, wounding the narcissist. And the narcissist must have to stop that happening. The narcissist has to assert control over you. And invariably, that manifests by trying to stop you going out. The narcissist must maintain the upper hand. And this is when you, in effect, are drawn into a battle in respect of trying to go out. The battle of going out has been joined. You will have experienced many occasions dreading saying that you have a social occasion to go to without the narcissist because you know how the narcissist will react. You will often turn these things down. Or you will leave it until the last minute before saying anything. Because even though you are just going out with your friends, you always experience this reaction from the narcissist which is unpleasant and devaluing. This behavior of the narcissist embraces the following. 1. Issuing a preventative hoover to halt you from doing something else. The doing of something else makes the narcissist feel like he does not have control, and therefore the act of going elsewhere will wound, cause the ignition of fury, and therefore the response from the narcissist is designed to stop you going out and this is a preventative hoover. Two, if you still then endeavour to depart, but you respond in a hurt or argumentative or frustrated manner, you will then be providing the narcissist with challenge fuel. There is no longer any wounding because you're providing fuel, but your desire to depart, combined with your emotional response to the challenge fuel, you continue to threaten the narcissist's control. The narcissist must instinctively respond to assert control over you using one of the three assertions of control and in effect put down this rebellion caused by you. Fuel, of course, is being acquired, but it's negative in nature. If you don't then go out, the wounding stops. Furthermore, if you then back down and don't argue that you don't fight against our influence, then you're no longer giving us challenge fuel. If you sit crying, this is the provision of pure negative fuel. We have control and fuel. There's no longer a problem. If you smile and decide that, actually, no, okay, I'll stay in with you instead and I'll let the girls know I can't make it, then you're providing the narcissist with pure positive fuel. You're giving fuel and demonstrating you are under control and there is no longer a problem. The narcissist will repeatedly, and especially lesser and mid-range narcissists, try and scupper your social arrangements to stop you going out because you are ceasing the provision of fuel to the narcissist and threatening the narcissist's control by wounding and potentially then challenge fuel. The narcissist is obligated, although he doesn't realise this, when he's lesser or mid-range, to assert control over you, which means stopping you going. And the narcissist will come out with all manner of explanations, dependent upon the relevant school, threats, possible physical violence, pity plays, guilt, the whole range of different manipulations will be utilised against you in this battle to prevent you going out. In this instance, I'm going to provide you with a conversational exchange which is occurring between the narcissist, most likely middle mid-range or upper mid-range, and the victim. It contains a variety of different manipulations that are being used throughout. See, as you listen, if you can identify them. You never said that you were going out. I begin as I see you getting ready in the bathroom. You halt applying your makeup and turn to me. Yes, I did. I told you last week and again this morning. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I remember. No, you didn't. I'd have remembered if you'd have told me, I answer. I put it on the calendar. 
You walk to the kitchen and return holding a calendar with the words, Girls Meal Out, Leonardo's. See? You ask and jab a finger at the words. That? I thought that was referring to your nieces, not the girls, not you. You never said. Seriously? Come on. Why would my nieces be going to Leonardo's on their own, you ask? You've just written that in then when you were fetching the calendar. Look, the ink is still drying. You sigh in exasperation. I told you about it. It's in the calendar. I haven't been out in weeks. Well, neither have I, I comment. What? You were out last Friday, you answer, your voice rising. That was with work. It was still going out, you reply. It's not the same. You know I have to schmooze clients. It's hardly pleasure. I have to do that for business reasons. So I think you're being unfair by saying that that's a night out for me. Those clients you were with were and are your friends. It was a right royal piss-up. Oh, sorry, I forgot. You were there, weren't you? You know all about how I conduct my business, don't you? I declare. No, I don't. But they are your friends. So... I'm not allowed now to have clients who are friends, hmm? Jesus, why don't you just stop me from having any friends at all, hmm? Why not stop me going anywhere? You'd like that, wouldn't you? Just having me stuck in here all of the time. What are you talking about? I let you do as you please. No, you don't. You are determined to keep me on a leash. My friends take the piss out of me for how little time I get to spend with them. You halt the application of your lipstick. Who said that? Several people, actually. Jim, Richard, oh, and John. They say I'm under the thumb. <laughs> they have a cheek. Jim is completely under the thumb of Jessica. No, he's not. But you just change the subject, why don't you? You should be staying in with me. You never want to do that anymore. Don't be silly. I'm with you most of the time. Look, it's just an informal meal with a few of my friends. What's the big deal? Well, if it's not that important, then why do you have to go? Because I want to, you answer. Where are you going? You know that. I'm going to Leonardo's. Really? Who with? Jane, Sarah, Mary, Stephanie, Owen Carrie. I don't believe you. You've just made that up. What? No, I haven't. You're meeting a man, aren't you? Come on, who is it? Now you're just being stupid. Don't call me stupid. I'm not the one going out and leaving their other half on their own. I begin to shout. And you jolt at the sudden change in volume. You're up to something. You're wearing a different perfume. Come on, who is he? Seriously, you're paranoid. I'm just meeting the girls. No, I'm not paranoid. Who do you think you are saying that to me? You're messing me around. I know you are. You've been acting strangely the last few weeks. I know you are. Admit it. I move towards you and stand over you, putting my face in yours. You back away, eyes widening fearfully. I haven't, honestly, I haven't. I shouldn't let you go anywhere, you whore. I don't know why I bother with you. I was planning a pleasant evening in for us. I was going to cook you your favourite meal, and I've got a delicious bottle of Chablis chilling. But as usual, you're being selfish. Please, don't be like this. I'm just going out with my friends. I'm allowed to have some friends, aren't I? Not those harpies. They've got it in for me. I hate them. I hate you. Oh, please don't be like that. Look, I'll be back by ten at the latest, so we can still have some time together, you suggest. Is that supposed to make me feel pleased? Why would I want to spend time with you, you slut? I see, you want to have your way with him, do you, then, and rub it in my face? You're such a fucking bitch. You've backed away from this tirade, wincing with each bellowed sentence. This allows me to snatch up your clutch bag. You can't go out with any when you haven't got your keys and you haven't got your money, I say, holding the bag aloft. Please, I only want to see my friends. I rarely see them as it is. Please, please give me my bag back. Why are you being so horrible? Because you're cheating on me. I'm not having you spending our money on some other man. There is no other man. How many times do I have to tell you? Please let me go. No, nope, you're not going. You're staying here with me. I can't cancel, not this late. You say in dejection. Of course you can. He doesn't matter. There is no he. It's the girls. So you say, you're not going. If you do that, me and you are finished. What? Just because I want to see my friends. You slump onto the bed, your shoulders hunched, your head in your hands. You don't need them anyway. You've got me. Why does it always have to be like this? 
Every time I try and do something, you do this, you protest, and your voice breaks with the first sob of frustration. Now, no, I don't stop trying to blame me when you're at fault. You always do this. You always make me feel guilty or do something to stop me going out. Rubbish, you're making things up again. You're just trying to make me feel bad for you. It won't work. You know that. You start to cry as I stand, fueled by you, power surging. Here, I order, as I pull your phone from your bag and throw it down on the bed beside you. Ring them and tell them you can't make it. Say you don't feel well or something. I'll go and pour the shavli. Still sobbing, you fumble for the phone and pick it up before dialing the number. I stand triumphant, drinking deep of the fuel that you have given me during this exchange. I have won the battle once again, and this time I didn't even have to escalate it like last time. I suppose that was just as well, really, seeing as how you've only had the mirrors replaced that I had smashed. In this exchange between the narcissist and the victim, you will see that a variety of manipulations have been used. And it's an amalgam of middle-mid-range and upper-mid-range. But ultimately, the victim's response is the provision of pure negative fuel through crying, and therefore the potential wounding that was caused by going out has been averted, and the challenge fuel that she repeatedly was giving, in this example, has given away now to pure negative fuel, because the narcissist has got his way, and he has control, and his perceived supremacy has been asserted once again. His narcissism has enabled him to assert control over the victim, and therefore everything is well. Hence, he said, I'll go and pour the shabli. That compartmentalization that exists, the shifting from black to white in the blink of an eye, has occurred. This is an example of a conversation that you may well have experienced or something similar to it when you wanted to go out and the narcissist prevented you because the narcissist does not want you socialising with other people unless it suits him because it threatens his control and the narcissism determines that something must be done about it. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.